Welcome, Irish fans, to this week's edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show. This week, we are bringing you a musically-themed show from the floor of Notre Dame Stadium. Joining us this week, the director of the Band of the Fighting Irish, Dr. Ken Dye. He will be followed by 1971 Notre Dame graduate, former Notre Dame football player, and the longtime manager of the band Chicago, Peter Chivarelli. And yes, Peter brought with him the entire legendary Rock and Roll Hall of Fame band, which will be performing at halftime of the USC game with the Band of the Fighting Irish. But first, to get things started, here are your hosts, Notre Dame Vice President and Director of Athletics, Jack Swarbrick, and Notre Dame Football Offensive Lineman, a musician himself, and the leader of Wapu Nation, Sam Bush. Man, your introduction gets longer every week. Unbelievable. <sighs> I don't know, man. It's, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, okay. SoCal bragging rights. On <laughs> our, I knew our, I, I, knew I wasn't going to get away you, from you this must, one. You must be pretty fired up. This is a big one for me. This has been, I mean, I, I grew up a Notre Dame fan. Uh, or, uh, yeah, Notre Dame fan. And a good portion of my family is either currently at or alumni of that school in Southern California. Um, so there's a little family black bragging rights going on. But also, this is just personal pride for me. I love this game. How's the week of preparation been? It's been a good one. We're on the bye week and it's fall break. So uh, the student body actually got to go home, but we've been here uh, training. We got a bonus practice on Monday, which has been awesome. And we've been bringing the energy, man. It's been a lot of fun going out there and just working to accomplish our goal on Saturday. What What should we look for in this game? What are going to What are going to be the keys here? You know, this is going to be a physical game. Uh, we know that they're a great football team. I don't think we're very slouches ourself, but it, this is going to be a grinder for four quarters. Uh, Coach Kelly, I've said it before, I'll say it again, is preaching a faceless opponent and just going out and playing our game. And I think that's this week, maybe more so than any week we've played in so far, that's that's the mentality we really need to go into with. How's the health? It's good. I, I, I like where we're at. I'm excited. You, uh, we mentioned that uh, there's a natural rivalry for you being from there and having family from there. Are there guys on their team that you you played with or know? Oh, yeah. Uh, They got a corner, Jonathan Lockett. Uh, One of their linebackers, a guy named Grant Moore, was actually one of my best friends in high school. So he's coming out. It'll be interesting to see him. I don't know if I'd say I'm excited, (laughs) but, you know, it'll be fun. Well, you've really had an impact on this show because now we're all music, right? We've gone from an occasional musical interlude to uh, to a show that's going to feature a lot of music today. That's kind of different. Not, not only a lot of music, a lot of great music. Let's <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah, we're, we're, we got Chicago. Come on, let's let's be honest here. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we we thought we needed a theater big enough to 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 hold the band, and uh, yeah, this will do. I think we found the right one. <laughs> Well, good luck in the uh, in the little bit of preparation that's uh, remaining, and I can't wait to be with you next week and recap a victory. Can't wait. Thanks, man. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. seasons, Ken Dye has served as the director of the legendary Marching Band of the Fighting Irish. Dye also serves as a professor of music at Notre Dame, teaching a course entitled The Business of Music, and is a concurrent professor of computer applications, where he teaches the course Music Through Technology. Among his many other accomplishments, Ken has served as the composer-arranger for the Sydney 2000 Olympic Band and pops arranger for the Dallas Symphony. Prior to coming to Notre Dame, Dr. Dye taught at Rice University, the University of West Georgia, and at numerous high schools in California and schools in Mexico City. And in the interest of full disclosure during this USC week, we do need to pass along that Dr. Dye earned his undergraduate degree at the University of Southern California. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. That was kind of a low blow to start the show. Yeah, don't I'm you? used to it. Uh, nobody's perfect. Yeah, it's nobody's okay. perfect. And <laughs> 
I visit some alumni clubs, and I always get that as the opening line and have to figure out what to say. And, uh, yeah, I did go to USC. It's a fine music school, but my family grew up at Notre Dame. Well, how did you come to be here? That's a good question. The interview process probably started some 30 years ago uh, when I started applying for college jobs. I was a high school teacher, and I did apply for this job uh, back in the 80s, and they said, Oh, you did, you've done a lot of stuff. How old are you? And I told them, and, and I never heard from them after I told them how old I was. <laughs> and then it came up again, and I applied for it. It didn't happen. And then um, I finally left Rice University, and I got a call one day from Luther Snavely, who was director of the bands, and he said, you know, we have three retirements coming up. Uh, would you be willing to come up and work as an assistant for a couple years and maybe get a chance to apply for the top job? We were literally unloading the truck in Carrollton, Georgia, and I said, honey, don't throw the boxes away. <laughs> <laughs> so we came up here, and uh, we've been here ever since uh, 98. A couple, couple of decades. Yeah, yeah. About 18 years at that time leading the program. Yep. What, how has it changed? How has, how has the, the, your responsibility for leading the best band in the country changed? Well, the responsibilities are always changing. The student body changes. It's dramatically different than when I started here. It's probably different than when you went to school here. Uh, students change. Their tastes change. Their The things that they get excited about change. The institution is bigger. There's more people to coordinate with and to just make uh, things go smoothly at Notre Dame. So the job does get a little bigger each year. You hinted at it just a minute ago, but <clears throat> you were saying students change, their tastes change, and what gets them excited change. Uh, what gets them excited changes. How, as the band director, do you kind of roll with that and really embrace and adapt with that? We try and figure out what they're listening to, how they react to certain music. Music is kind of our home base of what we do our planning on. And we'll start, literally in January, start looking at the trends in music and study the different charts that come out in the spring and summer. And many of them start in Europe and work their way over to here. And when we hit summertime, that's really our busiest, busiest time getting ready for the year. I go into the basement and literally don't come out until end of July and try to get the program ready. Part of getting the program ready is, of course, assembling the band, right? Yes. So you get, get, if, if, um, if my children weren't didn't have my my gene pool and they wanted to be in the band, how, what's that process like? Where does how does it begin? Well, we're always needing people in the band. Uh, we're an entire cross section of the student body. For example, our largest set of majors in the band are engineers. There's 147 of them. So you don't have to be a music major to get in the band, but you got to want to play in the band. And we'll even have students switch instruments once they get here. They might just play the piano or the violin. Those are great instruments, but it's hard to march with those. <laughs> um, and they'll they'll take lessons so they can join the band, you know, as their time at Notre Dame goes on. So we're always looking for people. We're always teaching people to be a part of my program, our program, and developing them once they get in the program. The um, the halftime shows grow in complexity it seems like to me each year and certainly the entertainment value is a is a constant it's always great what's the process for designing a halftime show and all the elaborate movements that go well on? i have a really good staff there's six of us that are all committed to making this the best band around and uh, it normally will start with the music or an idea or a theme and then grow from there and then sam sanchez writes the choreography that the band marches to after the music is written and then we figure out how we're going to teach it maybe add some things and we pick up on ideas of just everyday events for example there was eclipse at the beginning of the year and i thought this is a really big thing i what it i was, I was th just seeing about the band and but everybody's out watching this clips and said we got to do an eclipse so we got to figure out how to do an eclipse and we did that for the uh, miami of ohio game Wow. That's so cool. You never know where the inspiration is going to come from, huh? No, you could be driving, you could be in the shower, you could just be in a conversation in the building and, uh, it, oh, let's do an eclipse. Now, 
most uh, most of our fans, if I say Notre Dame band, of course they think of the great the great full band here at the football game. But as I travel with our other teams, or if I'm if I'm in a hockey game here, if I'm if I'm on a basketball game, there are a lot of other manifestations of the band which are critical to the program here. We are very blessed to have the student body we have, where they want to get behind all the teams. They want to be have something to do on the weekend to support their school. And so we'll have over 300 uh, students volunteer to play in the other sport bands, and uh, they sign up between men's and women's basketball and then hockey. We have the largest hockey band in the world, and they, they love it. We have to cut 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 it down <laughs> because they want to play at the hockey. It's a great building. It's a great atmosphere. Um, they love the hockey band. Well, you know, <clears throat> at least if you go to Notre Dame, it's a well-known fact that the marching band for the Fighting Irish is the oldest marching band in the country. And coming with that, that comes with a lot of prestige. And wh- what's that like for you, being able to head that up? Oh, it's like pinch me, you know. This just doesn't even seem like the real thing. Here we're looking at this uh, stadium tonight, and uh, it's just, just beautiful. Everything's first class. But the most important thing is it's the students, the student body, the quality of the students and the values that they learn in their four years here is incomparable. And I can say that as a, both a parent and as someone who works here. To see the kids grow up coming in and learning what it is to work with one another and apply their knowledge and skills and gifts to become a help to society when they graduate. And I see that in all of the majors, all different players, players on the team that we have in class some of the best people you'll ever meet are the athletes here on campus and it comes from the institution and the people that run it we're going to be uh, joined a little later in the show with uh, the hall of fame band chicago and and your band and that band have a really special relationship tell us a little bit about it it's really special um a number of the members uh, received uh, instruction from father george Father George Ruskirkin, who was an assistant band director, started the jazz program here, the Collegiate Jazz Festival here. And, uh, you know, we'd, we started talking, and uh, one time uh, Jimmy Pankow called the band office, and I talked with him at length, and I go, this is really for real. Well, if it wasn't for Jimmy Pankow, I'd have probably not been in the music business, because when the album came out, summer of 1969, I heard those horns and the rock band. I thought, that's what I want to do. So it, they're an inspiration to everybody in my generation that went into the music business and taught kids to play instruments. They're an inspiration to the kids here at Notre Dame that get to work with them. And they're an inspiration to everybody that's still working at that age as the amount of energy and commitment they have. They're incredible. They'll be playing with you uh, this be. weekend for the game. Uh, how do you how do you make that work? Well, we're going to uh, uh, do it very carefully. We've been preparing for it a couple of months now, and uh, we've worked with the uh, sound system. And uh, I have a very good uh, confidence that it's going to work well on Saturday night, not just uh, from an audio quality, but uh, the visual the visual thing using the screen. It's just going to be an incredible experience for the fans. Well, it is going to be a great show, and I, this may be the ultimate unfair question, but uh, do you have a show in, in 18 years that just sort of stands out for you as just one that you think, boy, that was really special? Probably the show right after 9-11 in uh, 2001 was a special show that we uh, were able to join forces with the Michigan State Band but the whole audience was part of that show, and you could just feel the um, the patriotism, the camaraderie of the fans, and how important it was to come together as a student body and as uh, a community and as a nation to uh, come to grips with what had happened that that year. Well, if if if, if I've ever heard a testament to sort of what a band does for any university, but especially at this place, that description's probably it. It's a unifying force, and it and it creates memories for all of us, and you you have made sure that happens and done it extraordinarily well. Thank, well, thank you so you. much thank for your you service to this university. 
We'll be back in a minute with some very special guests. We represent the greatest university in the world. Let's carry that pride tonight onto this field and let's play for Notre Dame. And let's play for Our Lady. That's how we're playing today. I don't know what next week holds or the week after, three weeks down the road, but tonight, that's how we're playing this football game. Caught beautifully. What a play. Touchdown, Notre Dame. The Irish find a way. Our next guest is a native of Chicago who did not have a movie made about him walking on to the Notre Dame football team, but could have. Peter Chivarelli has loved Notre Dame his entire life. He played high school football at St. Ignatius and earned offers to play at a number of schools, including Indiana and Purdue. But Peter wanted to play for Notre Dame. So he got a job working for the asphalt department of the city of Chicago and opened a hot dog stand, Demon Dogs. Four years later, at the suggestion of some Notre Dame players, Peter applied to Notre Dame, got accepted, paid his tuition in cash, and walked onto the football team. While Peter was attending Notre Dame, a number of his buddies had gone to Los Angeles where they formed a band, the Chicago Transit Authority. For nearly 40 years, Peter has been the band's manager. And with the band in attendance here today, we are looking forward to talking to Peter about two of the great loves of his life, the band Chicago and the University of Notre Dame. Thanks, Jack. I, I should just get out of the way here. I got I got two <laughs> walk-on legends on either side of me. I should just I should just get out of the picture. I'm not there yet. This 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 man we can call a legend, but as he told me earlier, until I get a statue out in front of the stadium, I'll never be on his level. He is certainly a legend here, uh, Peter. Let me let me start by asking you, somebody who uh, who ran out of the, that, that tunnel in his day. How do you like the changes to this? Place? I believe me. Um, I give you so much credit. Uh, it's it's great, uh, not only for the fans, I think for the players, uh, for the whole image of Notre Dame. Uh, it's it's you know it's just hard to capture in words. But I mean the um, every every move that was made was so significant. Moving the marching band from the corner to they have their own section. The sound is much much better. The 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 visual of them in the stands is is excellent, and of course, um, you know the obvious, the jumbotron. Which um, anytime anyone got up to walk to come by me in my seat, they used to have a heart attack because if you missed the play, you didn't know what happened. Uh, so, uh, I mean, all these things, and of course, even speaking of the seats, um, for some reason. That I never realized two inches meant that much, uh, <laughs> but I must tell you, it's a heck of a lot of comfort because I used to. Sp I, uh, uh, mine is an aisle seat, and most times I was sitting on the stair, so <laughs> that two inches has really, really meant more than I realized. It's the little things that matter, right? <laughs> um, you know, I you've had a lot of <clears throat> great moments, a lot of honors in your life, but I kind of think one of the most important was being asked to speak at Ara's memorial and being the representative of all those guys who played for him. You, you know what, what, without a doubt, um, you know, um, Jack had mentioned, you know, players had encouraged me and everything. The one who actually came up and talked to me and said, you know, how, I see you here every week. You know, didn't you go to school? And I said, no, coach, I got a good job I got a great business going he said get yourself a degree and that was era <clears throat> and I said you know really I'm I feel like I'm kind of past that I I wanted to come here football was always my dream and he said well if it's that important and this was in the 60s I didn't even realize there were walk-ons and he said you could come and you could walk and try out for the team and I couldn't believe it I went back and I took a leave of absence from my job I gave my business to my parents and of course, my father didn't really speak to me till my junior year, because he couldn't understand. He kept saying, "You make more money than those teachers. Why do you?" Want I, said, <laughs> I, I said, "Dad, this is a dream I always wanted to do." And believe me, uh, whatever it did for me, and I said it in the speech right at the very end, uh, he changed my life. And and at the end, uh, and and believe it or not, um, I had filled out a paper. Uh, my junior year, I was trying to figure out what am I going to do going into my senior year? What did my Notre Dame degree mean to me? And I went in and they said, um, I, I went to a counselor, told him what I majored in. And he said, don't worry about that. 
85% of people never go into what they major. So now I was really confused. <laughs> and so what happened, he said, um, you, Notre Dame will prepare you for anything you go into. And it was so true. And I said, well, I'm just confused. And he said, start writing down a list of what you think you might like. And I started this list, and I called it my list of a 1,000 jobs. And the only one that I took was the one I didn't put on there, to be in show business and, and management. I had every other kind of thing you could think of. And I, you know, and it was just funny uh, going to L.A. to meet the guys uh, after graduation in 71, because um, they started in 67. They went to L.A. I started Notre Dame in 67. And um, I met you know, my partner now, Irving Azoff, and Howard Kaufman, who just had passed away, um, you know, were there. And we talked, and they didn't know anything about about me other than, you know, I was close with the band, and they were working with the band. They had a number of groups, Jimmy Buffett, the Eagles, um, Fleetwood Mac. And... Um, as we were talking, uh, somehow we got on the subject of football, and um, I was telling them about Notre Dame, and they said, oh, you follow it that much? And I said, oh, yeah. I went to school there, and they were surprised, and I told them I was on the team, and believe me, the difference, um, it, it, I could just see the way they accepted me with really no experience, uh, anything. They were just, they thought it was just, um, just great, and that's pretty much how I got that start and um, again I think back to those talks with Era when he would see me and uh, and, and encourage me and you know and actually it was almost like demanding but you know the thing of being able to come and play for him and the, you know the guys in the band they give me too much credit I mean it's they're greatly talented but pretty much everything I do I try to emulate and I say to myself, how would Era do this? You know, how would he approach this or how would he approach that? And, um, you know, the whole team concept, the whole, um, you know, to be together, uh, to work hard, um, you know, and, and that's pretty much how I've um, run the band for all these years. And we've been, you know, fortunate. It's, you know, uh, two of the fellows that were on uh, just went into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, the whole band a year before went into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and we're working on a new project now that's um that's really good. But again, um everything goes back to era and it was good that I didn't realize till I finished the speech, which I it never really hit me that I was the only player. And um I gotta tell you, um for days and it's it's hard to even talk about it now, but for days after I would think about it and almost break down because I'm thinking Heisman Trophy winners, guys that came close to the Heisman, 30-something All-Americans, everything, and, you know, and I was picked. So I um, I really felt uh, it was truly, um, you know, the biggest honor I could ever have. You've, uh, you, you remained close to Ara, obviously, over the years, from that first, those first encounters till till the very end. And one of the ways you honored him, of course, is the is the statue that people see at the at the stadium. How did the concept for that come, and 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 and, and why did you why did it wind up the statue it is? Well, what happened was this: um, one day I was sitting in George Kelly's office, and a group of Leahy's players came and put a statue right out and right in front of the, on the side of the stadium where his office used to see it. And George was going, what's going on? And they came and just placed it, and they left. <laughs> and then they were calling around to get donations to uh, build it. I mean, it was already, they put it up, but they were raising the money to pay for it. And uh, I thought, what a great thing. And it never really entered my mind until later on that, you know what? Um, if he has a statue, you know, Era should have one. So I actually called Era, and in one of our conversations, I told him, and he said, you know, forget about it. He said, I'm, you know, I'm happy. And he said, um, you're, you'll never get a statue done at Notre Dame of me. And I said, well, I'd like to try. So then I started, and um, I started with a small replica, 
and it didn't have any significance and I wasn't getting anywhere. So I had the sculptor make a bigger one and that seemed to get a little more attention. Uh, finally, I had to make a real big one and, and of course these were all pretty expensive endeavors, but I didn't realize um, the, uh, the whole process of how to get a statue. And of course what I never thought of, which was foolish of me, was that there was never a statue on Northern campus of anybody still living. So here I am trying to do this, and um, we finally were able to go back and forth. And how they, that particular uh, statue came about, Era didn't want any statue. He said, I, I don't want any statue where I look like a dictator. And he had 200 photos, and so did the sculptor. And without ever talking to each other, they picked that photo. Wow. And, wow. and yeah, because it showed a lot of emotion. It was the victory because we had beaten Texas, who hadn't lost for three years. Uh, they won for three straight years. It was the coach with the players. It, everything about it, he really liked. And of course, for me, here I am in this statue because, uh, and again, it goes back to um, everything happens for the best. He had called me near the end of the game and said, as soon as there's a timeout, I'm putting you in. Well, you know, they want to move the ball, the referee. I thought it was a timeout, and I couldn't wait to get in. <laughs> and so I went to run, and I realized that Arrow was holding me. Actually, he had his hand as he was reading his plays. I didn't realize his other hand was in my shoulder pad. And he pulled me back, and no, no, he says, they haven't lost in three years. I don't want them to feel like I'm trying to rub anything in. And, of course, the clock's running, and um, it expired. So I, and, of course, I didn't really even think I thought it would have been great to get in for the last few plays, but, um, you know, I didn't even think about it. We were so happy to celebrate. We picked up ERA, and I never, it never entered my mind, never dreamed that it would wind up being, coming this kind of iconic photograph, and it, it was, you know, it was on the front page of the New York uh, Daily Times or whatever it was and everything, and um, so that's how I kind of wound up um, in there. And, and with the statue, and, and of course, in the other part of it, I must have attended about 72 uh, meetings with the sculpture committee, and um, uh, my, my argument was they didn't want any more statues on campus, and I showed them across the street at the Snipe Museum. They had what looked like um, a car wreck that they had on the lawn, and then they had some bumpers all twisted, and I said, here's a man that not only returned Notre Dame football, but is now doing this thing of saving children's lives. I said, it's more than him just being a coach. I mean, this is someone, and, and he was the only Notre Dame coach to ever finish coaching who stood and lived in South Bend. I mean, everything about Era, uh, to me, I felt uh, he deserved it. And it took, you know, a number of years. We finally got an approval. It was after four years. Then there was another little glitch where someone else tried to bring in a statue without any permission, and then they put another moratorium, and it took three more years. But we finally, yeah, you got we it finally done. got it done. <laughs> well, you know, another incredible contribution that you've made to this university is actually right here in the football stadium, and it's the Chivarelli Lounge, which mm. we get to use for recruiting and hosting former players and everything. And it's mm. it's this incredible space that you've been so awesome to donate for us. But a little segue, walk us through how this kind of came about. Well, you know, it it was kind of an idea. It, you know, pep rallies used to end, and I never was a drinker in my entire life. And we'd be at the pep rally. I'd be with guys, and you'd want to talk. And they'd say, well, we're going over this bar or that bar, and I, I, I didn't really have any interest. Everyone kind of scattered. Some, some players had their kids. And I thought, gee, it'd be great if we had a place. And what happened... Um, I went into one of the I went into the current room that we now have as the players lounge. It was also used as the press room after the game. And I walked in there and I looked around and I remembered visiting Joliet Prison. And I said, This this is a room that Notre Dame's doing their press conferences. We should kind of upgrade it. And then I said maybe we could upgrade it, but really my thought was for Friday night to get the players to be able to go and stay together. Yeah. So that's how it kind of came. And then, I, you know, we also kind of evolved to um, to the thing of it would be great for the recruits on Saturday morning. So it became kind of a three-use uh, type of room where 
uh, the players, the former players used it Friday night. Um, um, Saturday morning, the recruits used it, and after the game uh, was our press conference. And we had, you know, Jack always, <laughs> he came up with the greatest line. <laughs> I don't know if you remember when we dedicated it. Jack thanked me profusely. We had a dedication ceremony, and he said, and we were so appreciative of Peter building this room. We towed his car today at the <laughs> at the lunch. <laughs> Remember, I went to the lunch and I came out. And they towed my car. No one, I, no one is above <laughs> Notre Dame police. No one. P- uh, Peter, we got to let you go uh, in a minute here. One final question. We've talked about your passion for this place, and of course, your passion for Ara and the football program. Your passion also runs to the Notre Dame band and all the support you've given it. Talk talk a little bit about your relationship with the great band. You know. The kids in the band are, and I didn't realize it when I was here as a player, because, you know, between school, football, and it was after, and it was a number of years after, I started realizing more and more and watching them and um, how hard they work, how much, how many hours, and I was really under the impression they were all on scholarship. So when I found out that there were no band scholarships, and that in addition there were auditions for it and everything else, and, of course, being in the music business, I kind of got drawn to it. And then with Dr. Dye and his staff and Sam Sanchez and Matt and everybody, Larry, um, I just started going around and just seeing if there was something we could maybe do or bring bring the band guys by to maybe talk to them and, and things like that. And, um, in fact, uh, Dr. Dye had me teach a couple management-type classes for uh, the music school and things like that years back. And um, and just seeing everything that was going on, and one of the things that bothered me was we, we played Michigan several years back, and um, it was a night game, and the band wasn't really allowed to go because uh, what happened, they, they couldn't miss any classes. And um, what I couldn't understand is it's on Saturday. They could leave on Saturday afternoon by bus, go down there, play the game, you know, it's not only great for the players, but our fans that come to the game get to see our band and hear the song. And um, so then we had a number of meetings with student affairs, and I showed them our tour book and how we go from city to city, and we could put them all on buses. So I kind of started sponsoring getting the buses to bring the 400 kids to um, games when it wouldn't when they wouldn't miss any class and there were no hotel rooms needed, and you just bus them down. They'd play, and they were thrilled to do it. Oh. And and actually, um, I don't know what they eat, but I know the food costs more than the buses. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was really, um, you know, and to see the, the appreciation of the kids and getting to know them and, you know, family members, everything. And I would bring the band by, and then some years back, and I think to this day we're still the only uh, band that ever performed with them here at Notre Dame Stadium. Dr. Dye, we talked about it. And we had put that together, and um, and of course the guys in the band are just they're great, and uh, that's kind of how it started. It evolved uh, when when um, you brought Under Armour in, they were just wonderful. I met with them; um, they gave me a special price. And one of the things I always wanted to do, because I heard from so many kids, the one thing they really wanted more than anything was the same backpack that the football team got. So Under Armour made a deal, and I, every year now I've been buying 440 backpacks. Uh, you know, we give them out, and Coach Kelly and Chad and everybody uh, will send some players over to help me pass them out. And in the year we were going into the uh, um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, we had a show in Fort, uh, Fort Wayne. We actually came with the whole band with the players and passed them out and talked to the kids. And wow. So it was so nice. Cool. Well, the- Peter, we can't thank you enough for being here tonight, but more importantly, for for all the points of contact we've discussed tonight, whether it's the stadium, ERA, your support of this program, your support of the band, you have been a great friend to Notre Dame, and thank you so much. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back in a minute. Hey 
a lot of Hall of Famers have played on this Notre Dame Stadium field, including our next guests, the rock band Chicago. Chicago was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in April of 2016 at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. It was their first nomination to the Hall. They are the first band to release top 40 albums in six different decades. Over the years, Chicago has released five number one albums, 23 gold albums, 18 platinum, and eight multi-platinum albums, and have sold more than 100 million records worldwide. In addition, Chicago has performed numerous times with the Notre Dame Band during halftime of games here at Notre Dame Stadium, and will do so again this weekend. But most importantly, for more than 20 years, a portion of the band's concert ticket sales have been donated to the Araparsegan Medical Research Foundation, and for the last three years, the Kelly Cares Foundation has been added to the donation lists. It is beyond an understatement to say we are honored to have Chicago as our guests on this week's Jack Swarbrick Show. They will play for us to close the show, but first joining Jack and Sam right now, three original members of the band, Robert Lamb, Lee Lochnane, and James Panka. Thanks, Jack. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the history of the Jack Swarbrick Radio Show, special guest has never had quite, quite, <laughs> quite the dynamic that special guest has today. Thanks, guys, so much for being here. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's like being on another planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You, 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 you did and you will a little later on in the show. May 8th, 1970, Bloomington, Indiana, my first Chicago concert. Wow. Uh, Was it good? You surely you remember <laughs> me there, don't you? Was that a war memorial? No. No, it was a little 500 weekend at Indiana University. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was in the, uh, the old field house there, as I recall it. Oh. But, uh, Memorable show and the uh, the start of, uh, of of my experience with and love affair with a great group. Congratulations on the Hall of Fame. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank, Thank you. you. What Appreciate was it. what was it like to get the news and what was it like to experience the induction? Very exciting. We we had been waiting for it for so long. We had been waiting for it for so long that uh, uh, we didn't really know how we were going to take it if it ever happened. And when it did, it was amazingly exciting, and uh, the whole process was great for us. We had a, a great time. And, you know, it's all about, it's about the fans. It's about uh, the public who uh, validates your work. And 37 million people stepped up to the plate and voted for us. They, wow. that was, they wanted us in there. For sure. <laughs> yeah, wow. that was amazing. That is amazing. You know, you're, you you work in an industry in a field where uh, durability isn't necessarily uh, the characteristic you see that often. No, you're supposed to have two hits and then break up. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? What went wrong? We thought about it a few times, but decided against it. <laughs> what what is the secret to that? I mean, how does it? It's got to be you're on the road a lot. It's got to be a bit of a challenge sometimes. How does, we, it, how does we, it work? We love we love playing music. First of all, we love playing music. We love writing songs. We love recording them. Um, it's uh, it's amazing to travel around the world and play for audiences of all kinds and all cultures, and uh, still have a rapport. It's it's uh, it's really really a unique experience. And it might not look like it, but it keeps us young. <laughs> <laughs> from from my perspective, it looks like it. I don't know about Sam. Um, you know, you guys have been a part of this incredible rock and roll group or music group I, I wouldn't classify you guys necessarily as one thing but going on with the inauguration in the hall of fame do you guys ever just take a step back and say wow i'm in chicago like that's that's my band that's what i get to do every day of my life when i wake we're up we're too busy to really think about it uh we're we're slamming right now the band is better than ever um we're having a lot of fun so are the fans and you know uh Every night you get up on that stage, it's like the first night because it's a new crowd and they're all there to hear their special songs. Mm -hmm. And these songs, little did we know, have become a mantra in people's lives. They've become a soundtrack and people come to the show to relive the moment that these songs represent in their life. And we see it going on. So it's like a communion, a give and take, and wow. it's awesome. You never get tired of that. Wow. Other than the obvious attraction of the Jack Swarbrick radio show, <laughs> what? why are you in South Bend? Why are you at Notre Dame? 
Uh, it's an honor. We've we've actually had uh, several interactions with uh, the great uh, Notre Dame band, uh, Dr. Ken Dye, but uh, our manager Peter Chivarelli, uh, who is an alumnus and very plugged in to the to the university and to the football team itself and the players, is our manager. And uh, oh, oh, oh. and we're here to honor. This procedure. That's, we are here that's to, incredible. We are yeah. here to honor Peter and this year and her, uh, to honor uh, our procedure. And how will you be doing that? We're going to rock. <laughs> As only we know how to do. We're going to jazz rock. We're well, gonna, you know, er, er, uh, Arrow will be in the building somewhere. Yeah. You know, and this this is a tribute to him as much as anything. It's, it's always an honor to be on campus. Uh, it's a great institution. And we love working with the band kids. They're a lot of fun, and uh, mm -hmm. it kind of sheds a good light on those kids. And working with them is a pleasure. Now, it, what, are, what are the challenges of playing in a small house like this <laughs> with, with a 400-piece band? Yeah, the echo is the hard part of, <laughs> about that, but you just uh, keep playing. You just if you run going. really fast, you can hear multiple performances <laughs> <laughs> in sequence. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, you know, you, we, we're talking about playing this awesome venue, and it's an incredible new stadium, but do you guys have a venue or maybe a show in mind that you could think back to and be like, wow, that was that was one that definitely stood out to me? I don't know. There's been a few thousand of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 we've Some of those tall buildings order, aren't tall standing order any longer. Now. Some of those buildings aren't standing any longer. <laughs> Uh, there, there was a half a million people on the 4th of July uh, in Philadelphia, um, uh, the capital of the country in the, in the beginning. Uh, we, uh, we also performed at Camp Lejeune. Uh, right. General Tommy Franks of the Marine Corps had just come back from Iraq, uh, Desert Storm, and we played the Marine Corps hymn. The general wanted for, to rock. Yeah, and a hundred thousand Marines and their families <laughs> went nuts, and it was about as good as America gets That's at awesome. that point. Oh it boy, I can great. imagine why that was so memorable. Wow. And recently, we played a place where we started out uh, in L.A. the uh, the famous Whiskey A Go Go, <laughs> where we played many nights when we were first starting. A year ago, we went back to that room and we played again. It was a live. Uh, a live show uh, on the radio, uh, and it was um, it was amazing. It sounded so good to be tightly jammed on that same stage. Um, it was magic. So you know that that was something I never expected to be able to do again. But uh, the the way it sounded and the memories attached to the room as we played those songs. Sometimes w there are some c songs that we actually rehearsed for the first time in that room before they ever got recorded. Oh, wow. So it was a trip. You know, I'd like also to an honor to be here playing with the Notre Dame Marching Band, and, and we're honored to be the only band, I think, that has ever played at a halftime show with the Marching Band. So oh, this is, this is they, always memorable. Not only that, but they actually formed our logo <laughs> with, I mean, ah. with their bodies and uh, Peter presented us with uh, photos from the booth of the formation on the field <laughs> and it's hard enough to draw or sketch much, <laughs> much less form with people I think it's some computer tech computer technology there but uh, I remember that that was that was really impactful y you mentioned playing the whiskey a go-go again uh, one of the consequences, of course, of your longevity is you're in a business that's changed a ton, right? Yeah. How, what, what, are, what are the things that are fundamentally different for how, how you operate today from what it used to be? Well, the business is completely different. And uh, the technology obviously has impacted what we do. Um, what hasn't changed is that it's the music and it's the songs that matter. The, the, the quali quality of them the performance of them and the appreciation of them that hasn't changed can you guys maybe look out and see some of these current artists and people doing it now and say these are just like us when we were getting our start because i know it has changed so much differently the way to write a song is different there's yeah. the whole electronic dynamic in music now but there's still a lot of guys going out and ground and pound writing yeah. songs in their garage with their buddies yeah. and you know it, it's just kind of a testament to what you guys are doing 
that's the only way to get it done, you know, when you're starting out. Just, uh, you know, get a bunch of your, your guys together and start playing. Yeah. Like Bruno Mars, I think he's going to be around for a long time, and he, he pretty much, it seems like he started back the way we did in the right. clubs. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He did, actually, yeah. You know, he's, he's, there's always going to be music. People always want to be entertained. The cream will always rise to the top. You know, there were there was lousy acts when we came around too, <laughs> and you know, and somehow uh, we had staying power. Again, you don't know that. You don't. It's it's fate. It's being at the right place at the right time. It's having talent. Uh, we do it the old-fashioned way. That's something that is coming back. You know, the canned music thing. I think is becoming tiring, and uh, people are uh, rediscovering live music. There's a lot more live venues. I'm living in Nashville now, and there's live music venues all over town. So, and people enjoy that. So it's the best. Yeah, you've always been associated with great musicianship and ambitious music. Um, how did I come to be? What? What? How did the Chicago sound? You probably told the story a million times. How did the Chicago sound become the Chicago sound, or back then the Chicago Transit Authority sound, or the CTA sound? I think it started the the, the way we do it today. We just figured out a song that we everybody wanted to play. We counted it off and started playing, and that's how it sounded. We didn't really attempt to sound any particular way, other than I think the the, the brass approach. We approach um, the horn section as a main character in the music rather than an afterthought. That might be part of that uh, identity, the signature. But it's really all of us brought our own thing to the table when the band started. Robert had his roots, Lee had his roots, Terry Kath had his, I had mine, by the bank. And you put all that together and you got your car. No, you get something special when you put that all together. Yep. We are honored that uh, you're spending time with us. Um, you're going to make a very special football evening all the more <laughs> special. We'll try and do, Sam and his teammates will try and do our part. Please, yeah, we'll, please. we'll try to hold up our end of the bargain, Chief. We, we know you'll take care of your end. I can't, I can't thank you enough for taking time out to be on the show. And we look forward to uh, closing it out in a little bit with a, with a very special surprise for the audience. So thank you very much. Thank we'll you. be thank back you. in a minute. Go Irish. The Monogram Club would like to welcome back all former student athletes, cheerleaders, managers, trainers, video technicians, and honorary members who are on campus this weekend. Thank you for your continued support of the Monogram Club and Notre Dame Athletics. Now entering its second century, the Monogram Club remains committed to delivering on the lifetime promise bestowed to Notre Dame student athletes. Through service, career development, and fellowship, the club remains connected to its more than 8,000 living members spread across the globe. The club's many programs and initiatives are funded solely through membership contributions, which allow the club to be a valuable resource and the connection that brings together the many generations of Monogram winners. Well, Sam, I think at the end of this show, we're only going to have two choices. One is we can just cancel it because it doesn't get any better than this, or we can really increase the budget because I can't imagine a better way to close the show than to say, ladies and gentlemen, Chicago. One, two, three, and... <laughs> Take away the biggest part of me Ooh, no, baby, please don't go And if you leave me now Take away
to have your love 